Okay, welcome to the vlog. So, uh, just to recap briefly, on this vlog, what I try and do is just turn on the camera and talk, and it's kind of an experiment to see if I can say anything coherent or not. Usually, I just ramble incoherently, so fair warning. I'm hoping with practice, maybe I can get better at this. We'll see how it goes. So, uh, I've been experimenting with kind of thingy of topics that I can ramble about. Uh, the last time I did this, last week, I talked about the thesis I did for my master's degree, which I was heavily invested in because it was my thesis, but nobody else cared about. I'm going to go back further in time now. I'm going to do the thesis that I did for my undergraduate degree which was 20 years ago, almost, way back in 1999. Uh, I think I still remember this intelligently enough to talk about, um, but, I, well, I, I reread the thing. Um, of course, when you research a thesis, you've got all this background knowledge that you doesn't make it into the paper because, uh, y you know, you, you've got like a word limitation. So some of that background knowledge, even though I've reread this paper just today, some of that background knowledge might be long gone. I'm going to do my best on this. I think I remember this well enough to talk intelligently enough about it. If I get anything wrong, just let me know in the comments or something. I'll, I'll accept correction on this. Um, so this is, yeah, this is something I did way back in 1999. I was a history undergraduate. Uh, even though I've now switched to kind of teaching ESL. There are a lot of history undergraduates teaching ESL. That's kind of a separate topic, but you know, it's hard to find jobs in history. Um, but yeah, this, this is what I was interested in. Um, history generally. So, for my undergraduate degree at my college, college in the American sense, meaning college and university are kind of the same thing. Uh, we, for the final year, we had to do kind of a thesis where we had to write some sort of uh, history report using primary sources. So, you, you know, you couldn't find books in the library. You had to go back to the original sources. And I think as the professor put it, he said before you were kind of like finding stuff people had already written about it and kind of synthesizing other people's reports. Now you have to go to the primary sources and kind of make a story or make a report where there wasn't one before. We had never done this before and this was very intimidating to, to us, you know, kind of our whole academic lives up until this point, we'd just been relying on secondary sources. So uh, it was something I was stressed out about even before my senior year because, you know, like we knew it was coming. When we were juniors, the seniors we knew were stressed out about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the big problem was I just didn't know what to do it on. I, I, you know, I was interested in history and I had all these areas I was interested in. I was interested in the French Revolution. I was interested in ancient Roman history. Uh, I was interested in Chinese history, but like, what, what primary sources did I have access to? And if, you know, this was in the 90s, right? So this was when the internet was still in its infancy. So you're kind of limited to what you can dig up in the library. Um, and a lot of the people I knew who were a year ahead of me were doing something like a media analysis thing. Like, uh, they were doing, like, how, uh, how cowboys were portrayed in the media from the 1950s, where you kind of, uh, or like how such and such a story was reported in the newspaper. So you kind of choose a story, you choose a newspaper, and then you do some sort of media analysis on how this story had been reported in the newspaper. That was kind of the easiest thing to do. Um, so, yeah, w uh, what to choose it on again. Th this was, again, it was a tricky one finding a topic. Uh, one of my classmates, friend and classmate, 
was interested in doing uh, how the Vietnam War protests had been at our college back in the 1960s. And that, that also sounded like an interesting topic to me. The, but the professor said no. They said anything to do with the Vietnam War, the secondary sources would be way too overwhelming. So that got mixed. Um, so I was thinking, I was at the time, uh, you know, student, young, was interested in these kind of leftist revolutionary movements. I had kind of radical politics myself. And I was thinking something that was still kind of popping up in the news from time to time was the Civil War in Colombia, which was kind of, at that time, at the time it was like one of the last kind of Marxist kind of uh, guerrilla civil wars out there. So I talked to my professor. I said, I've got this idea about doing a media analysis on the Civil War in Colombia. Uh, and I said, it, it's interesting to me because it's, uh, you know, it's kind of a, one of the last Marxist guerrilla groups. But also, I think it's manageable because there's so few newspaper articles on it. Like, uh, it, it pops up like once every month in the U.S. newspapers. So, like, even though the, the war itself has been going on for a long time, you can, the, me, the data you would get from the media analysis would be quite small. Uh, the professor talked me out of it. He said, no, uh, that's, that's not workable. He said, for one thing, this conflict in Colombia is very complicated. You have to go all the way back to the 1950s, to the uh, La Valencia, the, the, the kind of the street protests, and kind of trace that with all the different factions that have developed over the past 30 years. He said, the other thing is kind of exactly what you just mentioned to me. He said, it's, it's a non-story here in the U.S. Nobody cares about it. It doesn't get a lot of reporting in the newspapers. So, it would be, you know, it would be hard to find enough stuff on it to make it interesting. And then he said to me, here's an alternative idea. He said, do the Sandinista revolution or the Sandinista government in Nicaragua, uh, it's something that has very defined start and finish dates. So, you know, the Sandinistas came into power in 1978. They left power in 1990, so you've got that 12-year period. And uh, it's something that was a big media story at the time. Uh, and it's also, you know, related to the interest I had mentioned about kind of leftist movements in South America. Uh, and it was something that was very divisive in the Christian community. Now, I didn't mention this before, but I, I should probably mention this. I was at a Protestant college, uh, Calvin College. So, uh, uh, you know, a Christian college that was very kind of interested uh, in kind of the relationships between Christianity and politics. So the professor said to me, uh, the professor pretty much mapped out this whole thing for me. Uh, I didn't even really know what the Sandinistas were. I'll get into that in just a moment. I didn't know what it was at the time. Uh, but the, the professor said, choose a liberal Protestant magazine and a more conservative Protestant magazine, and you can trace the coverage both of them have over the 12-year period from 1978 to 1990. Uh, and he said, the, the conservative one, he said, do Christianity Today. The liberal one, he said, do Christian century. So he pretty much just kind of gave me the whole research project on a platter uh, because he, he didn't like my idea. Uh, but it, it, turned, it turned out to be interesting. So yeah, I'll talk about what I learned doing it. Okay, uh, some background on this. Actually, there's a lot of background on this. This, this is going to get complicated. We'll see how well I can explain this, I might ramble a bit. Um, I guess first thing, I was born in 1978. I was a senior in the 1999-2000 academic year when I was doing this. So I actually lived through it, um, kind of. Um, but, you know, like I was, I was just a kid when this, is hap when this was happening in the news. Uh, and it's weird 
It's weird how your perspective on time changes as you get older. Because the Sandinistas only, you know, they had lost power in 1990. I was doing this research project in 1999, so that was like just only nine years later. But like because I was young and because I had been a kid when this had been going on, it seemed like such a long time ago. You know, like I could vaguely remember a few things from the news uh, to the extent I remember the news coverage at all, but it was, you know, it was just like kind of in the midst, midst of kind of time of childhood and stuff like that. Now, now that I'm much older, uh, my perspective on time is so different. It's like, you know, 10 years ago was like yesterday, you know, like, uh, so it, looking back on this, it seems strange that I was doing a research project on something that was only kind of finished nine or 10 years ago. And I was regarding it already as kind of way back in the past, but that's how you view time when you're young, huh? Anything from childhood is like way, way ancient history. Um, yeah. Okay, so I, I was doing this in 1990. It was something that took place from 1978 to 1990. Uh, why don't I... Yeah, okay, sorry. I'm... Stuff I remember from childhood. I remember kind of the 1990 election in which the Sandinistas lost power. It had been kind of... I was 12 years old at the time, I guess. And it, so right about the age when I'm just paying attention to the news a little bit, and it had been kind of a big news story at the time, although I didn't really understand who the Sandinistas were, but I, I understood that everyone in the U.S. media was kind of excited that they had lost power and that this was kind of regarded as a good thing. Also, the Iran-Contra stuff, which had taken place a few years earlier, I remember that being in the news. I remember Ollie, Oliver North being on TV. I was, I don't know, seven years old or something, seven, eight years old. I didn't understand any of the politics of it. I just remember him seeing him on TV. I actually felt sorry kind of seeing him on TV because, you know, it seemed like he was in trouble. My, you know, my mom told me he was in a lot of trouble. He just seemed like such a polite guy. He was like dignified and you know, clean shaven and, you know, nice haircut and everything. I don't know, just, just you know, real clean cut guy. And these senators seemed like they were being so mean to him. I just felt really bad for him kind of as a kid. I, I was politically unsophisticated. I was seven. Uh, now that I actually know what he did, I, I think I've got a lot less sympathy for him. But, uh, you know, I think, I think, People had a lot of sympathy for him at the time. I mean, I was seven, so I've got an excuse. I was just a kid, but people who were much older than me and didn't have that excuse kind of also felt sympathetic for him. I think, I think he actually got a lot of public support. Anyways, those are kind of the two things I remember. The rest of this, I do not rem I, Other than that, I really did not know anything about the Sandinistas or Nicaragua or anything. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, most people don't know anything, right? I mean, like, do, do you know anything about Nicaragua in the 1980s or the Sandinistas? It's kind of, it was a big deal in the 80s, but it's kind of been completely forgotten, hasn't it? Like, nobody talks about it anymore. People remember Iran-Contra kind of, but nobody remembers that Iran-Contra, that like, people remember the Iran part of Iran-Contra. Nobody knows that it had anything to do with Nicaragua. I, I think, aside from, you know, geeks, people who take a special interest in kind of politics and history and stuff like that, this is just kind of completely forgotten nowadays. Nobody remembers it. It was, it was a big deal in the newspapers uh, at the time. This was, a big US, this was a big story in the U.S. news during the 1980s. Okay, so what happened? Uh, so there are kind of three layers to this. There's what actually happened in Nicaragua, because Nicaragua is where it was all happening. There was a revolution on the ground, and then there was kind of political events afterwards. Then there was what was happening in U.S. politics, because the U.S. was heavily involved in Nicaragua 
in the 1980s one way or the other through kind of covert means or not so covert means. I'll get into that later. Uh, and then there was the politics of it because this was very split among Republican and Democratic lines and there was considerable disagreement about what was happening where Republicans had kind of one view of reality and Democrats or liberals had another view of reality. And it's one of those things like the Vietnam War where kind of to this day it's a little bit difficult to understand what really happened. You've got the right-wing version of history and you've got the left-wing version of history and it's kind of hard to make like a neutral version of history. Uh, you just have to say, well, this is what the right thought, this is what the left thought, this is what the right thought, this is left, what the left thought. Who knows what really happened? Um, and then there was, uh, again, because I was doing this at a Christian college, I was researching Christian periodicals. There was a split, uh, a big split in Protestant Christianity about how to regard this. And some of this is a lot of this is because of kind of the shifting political climates in Christianity at the time. And, and uh, uh, yeah, let me come back to all those and let me just kind of talk about what happened in Nicaragua. So uh, Nicaragua, uh, the U.S. has kind of been involved in Nicaragua a lot, kind of if you go back in history. This doesn't make the U.S. history books because uh, we kind of tend to kind of leave a lot of this stuff out. But there were kind of frequent invasions of Nicaragua kind of going all the way back to the 19th century. There was a guy, I think his name was Walker. Uh, he was an American adventurer who just kind of conquered Nicaragua on his own in the 19th century. They actually made a movie about him during the Iran-Contra thing because, it, you know, it was topical to talk about Nicaragua at that time. Look it up if you get a chance. It's a 1987 movie. I think it stars Woody Harrelson or was it Ed Harris? I always get those two guys mixed up. Um, so that, that really had nothing to do with what happened in the 1980s, although people... In, during the 1980s, people were kind of remembering the past invasions of Nicaragua. Uh, there was a Nicaraguan president, I forget his name, in the early part of the 20th century, who kind of made a big push for independence and kind of pushed the British out of Nicaragua, because I think they had some bases there, and uh, tried to nationalize stuff. And the U.S. had some investments in Nicaragua. So uh, the U.S., I think this was under President Wilson, invaded Nicaragua and kind of put down the government and tried to install their own friendly government. And what happened is uh, the kind of, it created a guerrilla insurgency, kind of led by the, the liberals or the leftists in Nicaragua. Uh, and there's a guy named Sandino that uh, was the leader of that. Meanwhile, uh, the U.S established its own government uh, and then we tried to leave but then there was an insurgency and we came back uh, and there was a guy who was a head of the National Guard named Somoza who had actually been living in the US he had been like a car dealer in the US who was very corrupt and kind of ran the National Guard like his own mafia he actually ended up doing a coup in taking control of the Nicaraguan government, but he was very friendly with the U.S., so the U.S. was fine with it. I think Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a famous quote. He said, so Moses a son of a bitch, but he's our son of a bitch, because he was like very friendly to the U.S. and kind of friendly to U.S. business interests and stuff like that. Sandino got, Sandino was leading the guerrilla movement he got tricked. He was invited into a negotiation and then he was asked to kind of, he came to the negotiation and he just got ambushed and killed at the negotiation. And then they kind of killed a bunch of the rebels, but there was like some guerrilla insurgency still. And the Somoza family just kind of controlled Nicaragua throughout most of the 20th century. Somoza himself was really corrupt and people hated him. He actually got assassinated by a poet uh, who kind of smuggled his way into the party and shot him. 
sometime in the 1950s or 1960s, I forget when. So he had two sons that took over. One of the sons, I think, died in 1967, but the other son just kind of clinged on to power. And these, this Somoza family was bad news, like no matter who you want to ask. Now, this is, this is one of the few things about this period that's not controversial. Right wing, left wing, whoever you want to ask, everyone agrees that Somoza was actually really terrible. There was a big earthquake in the capital of Nicaragua in 1973, maybe, uh, that was really devastating. A lot of international aid poured in and like the Somoza family just kind of hoarded the public aid and didn't give it to the poor people. They had like a cronyism thing going on where they were just kind of cultivating the other leaders of the country and uh, you know the rich were getting richer and the poor were getting poorer. It was just classic corruption and everyone hated the Somoza government. So the insurgency got bigger and bigger and bigger until it got to the point where really everybody was against Somoza. Now this included not only the communist guerrillas fighting in the jungle, but this, this was kind of everybody. Like even the bourgeoisie in the capital of, of Nicaragua were against him. Uh, and in fact, there was a moderate opposition newspaper called La Prensa, I believe. Sorry, I should have said this at the beginning of the video. I never learned Spanish. So I'm going to mangle all these Spanish names and stuff like that. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, and the head of the opposition, the bourgeois opposition, got assassinated. Nobody knows who did it, but everyone was pretty sure it was on Somoza's orders. So, yeah, eventually everyone just turned over to the insurgency. And what happened with the insurgency, I guess, because it was just kind of all of Nicaragua against Somoza, is it included all the elements of Nicaraguan society. Uh, and they called themselves, there were a couple different factions, but like the, I think the main one was the Sandinistas. Uh, and they had an acronym in Spanish, I think, which was FSLN or something like that, which makes sense in Spanish. But Sandinista is what everyone calls them. And they were closely tied in with elements of the Catholic Church. Now this is where kind of the religion element comes in here. During the 1970s and the 1980s in South America was kind of the heyday of what is known as liberation theology. Now liberation theology is a whole topic in and of itself, so I'm not going to do it justice here. It's worth kind of looking up maybe. But that's where the Catholic priests or the, the Catholics in South America were very interested in kind of helping the poor people and helping the poor people often through political programs, which intersected heavily with Marxism. So there were a lot of these Catholic priests who were kind of with the Marxist guerrillas or had Marxist sympathies, and this was kind of known as liberation theology. Uh, it was a big thing in South America. The problem, the issue, one of the issues, well, one of the issues was that there was a lot of right-wing governments in South America. So, for example, and I think it was El Salvador, the bishop got assassinated. I think it was Romero. But the other issue is the Pope in the 1980s was John Paul II, who was not in favor of liberation theology. He was much more on the conservative end. So that was kind of an issue butting heads in the Catholic Church when the, when the Pope would make visits to South America. But in Nicaragua, a lot of these priests were actually joining up with the Sandinistas. And in some cases, the police, sorry, police, the priests, the priests were actually leading guerrilla armies of kind of uh, Sandinista soldiers. Also, the founder of the Sandinistas, there were, like, um, there were like a bunch of founders, but by 1978, there was only one guy surviving, and his name was Thomas Borges. Sorry, it's a Spanish name. Uh, I'm mispronouncing it, I'm sure. Who was very openly a Christian and kind of very pro-Christian. So anyways, the, the Sandinistas, it was a big bloody fight, and kind of Somoza, 
threw everything he could. He kind of bombed his own cities and uh, did a lot of bombing of his own cities and killed a bunch of people. But finally, Somoza had to flee the country and the Sandinistas took over. And initially, Somoza was so hated kind of everywhere, even internationally, that initially the Sandinistas got good press everywhere, even in the United States, or at least kind of moderate press. Um, but people at the same time were cautious because this was 1978, this was right in the middle of the Cold, Cold War, and the Sandinistas were very left-leaning. I mean, they weren't, they were kind of Marxist, they weren't controlled by the Soviets, so they were independent, but they definitely had Marxist sympathy, so there was a big worry about it. Initially, the Carter administration gave them aid, but then the Carter administration cut that off very quickly on some sort of pretext what are, uh, uh, or another. I forget what that was. Then Reagan, of course, got elected in 1980, and Reagan administration was very hostile to the Sandinistas, and that's kind of where we get into this whole mess. So, in the U.S., the, the yeah, okay, uh, maybe I'll go with the Reagan element first. What, what was Reagan doing? So, after the Sandinistas got power, uh, there was an insurgency against the Sandinistas and this was called the Contras, and the Contras were a guerrilla fighters fighting against the Sandinistas. Sandinistas used to be guerrilla fighters, but now the Sandinistas were in control, so now it's the right wing that's the guerrilla fighters now, known as the Contras. Now, this is one of those things where the history gets a little bit confusing, because who are the Contras? It depends who you ask. Uh, the, the left wing version of history is that the Contras were Somoza's National Guard. Because remember, Somoza ran his National Guard like a mafia. So these are kind of the ex-soldiers ex or National Guards who had been kind of military thugs under Somoza and wanted to get back in power and were now Contras. The Reagan version of history is the Contras were just kind of patriotic Nicaraguans. They were kind of made up of, of people who had been part of the mainstream opposition to Somoza, like the La Prensa magazine where the guy had been assassinated. Uh, and so were, were these kind of right-wing thugs or were these kind of more mainstream Nicaraguans? It depends who you ask. But whatever they were, the Reagan administration was funding them. And of course, in the 1980s, you had the Republican President Reagan, but the Congress and the Senate was controlled by the Democrats. And the Democrats passed some sort of law, I forget the name of it, something something Boland, which prohibited Reagan from funding the Contras directly. And this is where Iran-Contra comes in, because then Reagan started funding the Contras secretly, right? Remember Iran-Contra? So the Oliver North, uh, one of Reagan's guys sold I Iran weapons, which was a big deal because we weren't supposed to be selling Iran weapons at the time. Iran was our enemy. Uh, it was kind of a weapons for hostage deal. Iran paid the money for the weapons and then that money got funded to the Contras. So this was why this was such a big political deal in the US. And also, now again, this is again where we've got two versions of history, the right-wing version, the left-wing version. Uh, the Contras have been linked to a lot of atrocities in Nicaragua. Um, so if you believe kind of the left-wing version of the story, the Contras did not the, the, the ordinary people overwhelmingly supported the Sandinistas, kind of, you know, the poor people in the villages. And they would go and vote for the Sandinistas in the elections. So in order to undermine the, the Sandinistas, the Contras would go through, and anyone who had voted in the elections, would, they'd just kind of blow up their hands. Uh, and there's a lot of really nasty stuff that got reported about the Contras kind of mutilating children in these villages blowing up the hands of children, rapes, and all this awful stuff that the Contras were supposedly doing. Uh, now, on some level, I think the fact that some atrocities occurred, nobody denies. It's just a question of the scale of it. You know, the Reagan administration 
uh, was saying, ah, okay, there's a few atrocities by the Contras, but it's nothing as bad as the Sandinistas are doing. The left wing was saying, okay, you know, the Sandinistas are doing a few bad things, but it's nothing as bad.